Money Smart Guy, Matt Zapala here, healing to you from Dallas, Texas, here at the PHP Podcast Studio at the home office in a suburb of Dallas called Addison, Texas. And today, we've got episode 25, to episode 25, 24, 25, somewhere in here. But we're going to be talking about going from zero to millionaire, people that have helped us, how important mentorship is. And we just recently came back from Patrick Bet David's birthday bash in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and our 12th anniversary of PHP Agency, starting in this episode of PHP Podcast with my co-hosts, both Marlene Gaetan and Rodolfo, and Cesc, and Rodolfo Vargas from Houston, Texas. So let's get it started in three, two, one. Let's go. All right, we're back. So I'm joined today by fellow first generation cash flow millionaires from Santa Ana, California, Orange County, California, Marlene Gaetan, and from Houston, Texas, Rodolfo Vargas. So Marlene, Rodolfo, what's up, guys? How you guys doing? Good morning. Good morning, everybody. I'm super excited to be back. I missed the podcast. I missed everybody here. So I'm just super excited to have an awesome episode with you guys today. It's going to be fun today. I'm telling you, I'm glad to be here. Uh, thank you, Marlene. Thank you, Matt. Because today we're going to be talking about the topic of today actually is how to go from zero to millionaire. That's what it is, right? That's right. What's the story? How we, we went from nothing to making seven figures a year. That's right. And by the way, Rodolfo, Marlene's coming back to this podcast with another edition because last time we saw her, she was still pregnant. Marlene, what has happened between then and now? What happened? We have a new addition in the Gaitan family. It's my third little man in the family. His name is Elon. My husband is obsessed with Elon Musk. Um, in fact, yesterday he just told me, he's like, babe, we got to trade in your Bentley for yeah, another yeah. Tesla because in this family we should only drive Teslas. So he's obsessed. So his name is Elon. Middle name is Theodore um, after president. So I call him Teddy. He's my Teddy. Um, and we're just so happy. Uh, I have a five-year-old boy, Preston, a seven-year-old, Snooky, and they're just absolutely obsessed with the new addition, baby brother. So super excited to not be pregnant for all the women watching this. You know exactly what I'm talking about. So they're like, you're so happy on social media. I'm like, because I'm not pregnant anymore. That's why I'm so happy, right? <laughs> Last weeks are just unbearable. So, yes. You know, you know when I met Marlene, uh, they were dating Jose. They were dating Jose when I met Marlene, and um, now it's so nice. You, everybody can see their family, a yeah. beautiful family now with three boys, with three boys. What a great, what a great picture. Jose. What a great picture there, Marlene. That's Preston. Awesome. Thank you. Luke and Elon. Yeah, Preston, Luke and, Elon. Luke and Elon. Yes, 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 yes. And God willing, we still want two girls, so I don't know if they're going to be adopted or... You know, fun fact, I actually applied to be a foster parent for all the kids crossing the border because that's how I came to this country as a little oh, kid. Wow. Um, but they're in Texas. I still haven't gotten a call back. So we'll see if I get approved or not. We do travel a lot, you know. So, but the boys keep asking, when are the girls coming? I'm like, I don't know. But God willing, one day we'll have two additional girls to a family. We'll see. Wow, it's amazing, Marlene. And by the way, Rodolfo, you also had a baby boy yep. this year. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, we had a baby. So we have Milo, which is my, my first son. And we just had another one, uh, which is uh, uh, Enzo. Enzo, that's the name of the second one. One is, uh, well, Milo, his name is Rodolfo Emilio, but we call it Milo. And then we have Enzo Antonio. And, um, and, and I was telling Marlene backstage, if we were to have a girl, what would be the name of the girl? <laughs> but I cannot say it in, in a... In a I cannot say it in public right now. Ceci will kill me if I do that. I'll just say that I'm Team Ceci. So <laughs> that's all I'm going to say, Team Ceci. No, no. It was a lot of Nobody boys. Be, between, between Marlene's three, Rodolfo, you're two. Uh, I've got three, right? So we got, we got, we got uh, eight, nine boys between the three of us. So, mm. hey, man, we, uh, we're, we're producing. So we, we yeah. got, uh, we got, uh, uh, she and I have a baby fever, thanks to you guys. So uh, that's why I just tell her, babe, you want to have another kid? Babe, babe, I got the easy part. I got the easy part. You know, you got the nine months, you know, <laughs> like what Marlene was talking about. Oh, yeah. <laughs> By the way, isn't it cool to know that the, the common denominator between all three of us 
is there's not a United States college degree amongst the three of us. Can you believe that? Can you believe that, that none of us, we have a, we have a degree. So I went to school in, um, um, I went to school in El Salvador. When I went to school over there, I came into the U.S. My dream was to go to college. That was my entire dream. I wanted to go to college. So I told my mom, listen, I want to go to UC, USC. I want to go to UCLA because we're in Los Angeles, right? My mom said, listen, son, you're not the smartest kid in the family, okay? <laughs> your brother is going to go to school. Your sister is going to go to school. You're 22 years old. So you go better, go, go find a job. That's what my mom told me. You know, most of the mothers, they want the kids to go to college, right? Not my mom. That time my mom wanted me to go to school. And now you went to military, right, man? Yeah, yeah, with the military, correct. How old were you when you got enlisted? I was, I was, uh, I think I just, I think I just turned 17 because I, I just turned 17 because I enlisted during basketball season. And then wow. I just, I just turned 17. So uh, by the time I left, uh, time I graduated high school and went to boot camp, I turned 18 years old in boot camp. Matt, what was your mom's reaction? Because I have, I have three boys. I can't imagine a 17 year old telling me this. Did she cry? What was her reaction? On top of that, a Filipino mom to add, add extra drama to it. Oh no, yeah. oh, oh no, mom, mom, sign, sign the dotted line. I want to go to the military, I want to go to the Marines. Oh no, are you sure? And then the recruiters at the house, because I needed a parental waiver because I'm not old enough to sign a legal contract. So uh, she signed up, that's, she was basically, you know, worried till this day she's still worried you know I'm, I'm 47 years old today and she's still mothering it's a kind of a amazing thing but uh yeah she was she was nervous but uh i i play the worst pranks though i play the worst pranks on my mom when i was in the military. it's probably not the best pranks to pull but uh especially for a worrying filipino mom i'd call back i call back yeah yes i call at the, at the hospital because my mother's a nurse obviously the filipino mom's nurse i call back oh yes ma'am is this uh is this a uh, uh it's just Mrs. Ron, Ronnie uh, Ronnie Sapola. Yes, yes, yes. How can I help you? Yeah, this is Sergeant Campos uh, from uh, United States Marine Corps Camp Pendleton. I just want to let you know that your son was uh, in a major infraction today. He had a complication. And what happened? Well, ma'am, there was a little bit of a mishap. And uh, is he okay? Is he okay? Ma, I said, Ma, mom, settle down. It's me. Settle down. You're, you're starting to. Oh, oh. My mom's all, I, I was bad. I played the word <laughs> pranks. <Exactly. laughs> Oh, your poor mom. <laughs> Marlene, how about you? You 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 were like a, you were very young when you got started in the businesses, right? Oh, you were I remember you, you used to say you used to be um no a model, no, you used to be a reporter, right? For MTV. Yes. Something like that. Yes, yes, yes. I actually I got recruited to mortgages at 17, but in 2008 when the market crashed, I was pretty young. And living in Los Angeles, everybody knows somebody. So uh, mortgages were not moving. So they said, hey, you should work for MTV in Espanol and Telemundo. And so I did a couple of shows, a couple of music videos. And, you know, it's fun to be on camera and get dressed up. But I realized, man, all these beautiful girls in L.A., they're so vulnerable because you don't make any money. You just don't. And there's so much competition that I said, you know what? It's cool to be the pretty girl on camera, but it's so much cooler to be the entrepreneur that makes money and that has more more control of the life you want to design for yourself. Right. But it was such a great experience. How crazy I was. I, we used to watch MTV in Mexico. I, we had Telehit. That's what we had over there in, us. in Mexico. We used to watch it in, in, in El Salvador. But MTV was big. I, re, I grew up watching watching all the music videos in a TV. That's the way that I grew up. Interesting. So I, I want to ask you guys, uh, because uh, by the way, uh, Rodolfo, I was eating um, some papusas and some uh, sopa. Uh, what's that? Sopa uh, de pollo. Pe uh, sopa de gallina. Sopa de gallina in India. That's oh. why he was eating yesterday. <laughs> How was it? It was delicious right here in Dallas, right here in Dallas. And there's a lot of Salvadorians out here. I didn't realize there's, if I was to Google Salvadorian restaurants, that's quite a few of them no. out here. And, you have no idea how many Salvadorans are in the U.S. It's insane. Yeah. It's, 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 Mexi it's Mexicans, then Puerto Ricans, then Salvadorians. But Salvadorian is so small. It's a very small country. It's yeah. very small. Salvador is the size of Maryland. Wow. That's the size of El Salvador. That's the size it. of Connecticut, maybe. And uh, But we like to be around it. We like to make a lot of noise. That's what we like. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I want to ask you, Rodolfo, I mean, uh, you yeah. If you guys don't know Rodolfo's story, he came into the United States and was a loss prevention 
officer, which basically is a glorified term for security guard. Uh, at, uh, what, what, uh, what store was it? What uh, was it? Sears. Sears. So I call it last prevention security guard. Basically, I was a janitor. That's what I used to do because uh, I, I was the new guy, and uh, they used to put me to. You know, when you're the new guy, you don't speak English. You don't know how to defend yourself. You don't know what to say and anything. Yeah. And you're new in the country. Yeah. So um, I'm the typical story about the immigrant. It gets over there, get a job. And they used to tell me to do all the errands. I used to be the guy, hey, go clean over there. Oh, go. Somebody puke over there in the, in the, in the restroom. And I was, clean, I don't want to do that. Clean up in all three. Clean up in all three. <laughs> oh, somebody like, oh, my gosh, I hate it when this happened. You know, when little kids, they go to store and they, they pee themselves from the middle of the yeah. store. And they used to call me to clean that stuff. I hated that stuff. Okay. And um, but yeah, and I worked over there for, for a couple of years. For a couple of years, I did that. I got my real estate license too. You know, I got my real estate license. I was a really good test taker. So I didn't know too much English, but I understood the, how I'm a really good test taker. So um, I passed my real estate license, didn't sell, didn't sell one single home. And um, no, no one single home I sold. And, um, but I hate it, man. It's, it's like, a, I promise you, I tell people this. If, if I wouldn't have found PHP, I could be still working at Sears. That and, bad it was. By, by the way, I uh, just want to let you know, Rodolfo, I think uh, you have a big fan in uh, Adam Sosnick. You know, so, you know Saucy? Yeah. Like, uh, Value table. Soy boy. Yeah. Soy boy. <laughs> He's a big fan of yours. He's a big fan of yours. You know, you know, you know he'd tell me, Matt, you know, a guy like you, you're here in America, you speak English, you're raised here, blah, 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 you're, you're this, you went to the military, you're supposed to win, you're supposed to succeed, okay. But the guy Rodolfo, I don't know, man. I mean, honestly, <laughs> he, he told me this in Vegas. I don't know if without PHP and the mentorship and the guidance that uh, Rodolfo and Assessi get here, I mean, Rodolfo didn't even know how to speak English when he got here. I mean, what company, what financial services company is going to have enough patience for a guy to learn not only a financial language to sell life insurance, but also have enough guidance and mentorship to be patient enough to get him to speak English. That, so that is true. The question I want to ask you is who helped you along the way? Say that again? Who helped who help, who you? Brother, I mean, uh, I'm not here without Patrick. I'm like, okay, okay. It's different people, okay? Different people. Like, um, I'm telling you, number one is Patrick but David. I'm not here without Patrick but David. He, he because you know what's the the this the the strength you know he's our mentor he's your mentor he's Marlene's mentor yep. he's the strength of Patrick and this is why he understood me um what I was going through yeah. many people when I got started in the business were like oh poor Rodolfo you know oh my gosh he's oh my gosh he doesn't know he doesn't know so Patrick was very smart to or he was wise enough so to never feel sorry for me yeah. or to never make me feel like a victim. Yeah. You know, so many immigrants, and I'm speaking from immigrant side, okay? From the immigrant side. Yep. Many immigrants, they say, I want to become a millionaire. I want to become successful. I want to run my own company. But they say, I want to do it my own way. And I want to play the victim. There is no way you can become successful playing the victim. So it was like this. Um, I'm, it was like this, Patrick, I mean, uh, what if we do this and uh, what if you make it easier? Say, there is no easy thing here. You need to learn. You need to learn English. You need to learn financial services. You need to learn. But, 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 but what if I, it doesn't matter. You live over here in America. And I was like, damn, nobody has ever talked to me like this. Yeah. <laughs> no, nobody has ever like put the standards so high because if you want to play in the market, basically, in the market doesn't care if you're a Filipino. Oh. The market doesn't care if you're a woman. The market doesn't care if you're from Mexico. The market doesn't care if I speak English or Salvadorian. Yep. The market care about what? If you play in the market, if you play at that level. So that was the strength of a Patrick. Patrick always, um, he never felt sorry. He never made me feel a victim. And he makes me play with everybody. Imagine how strength, how powerful that is. And, you know, you, you, uh, you remember when we had, um, you guys remember we had a few years ago, we had, during the direct, it was the director's meeting, we had Nick Vujicic. Uh, oh speaker. my gosh, what a great, go ahead. Yes, I remember. Yeah. So let, let me show, let me show a picture of Nick Vujicic. Okay, so uh, this is Nick, Nick Vujicic here, was born literally with no arms, no legs. 
And he basically, he, he jokes about it. I'm not calling it, but he jokes about it on stage. He calls it, he was born with a little flipper. Uh, there's, I guess, his left, <laughs> his left as he jumping into the pool. But this is how he was raised. And he shared something on stage with, which I thought was pretty profound. And this is what he said. So when I was a little boy, I was in the kitchen trying to make myself a bowl of cereal. And I couldn't get milk. I couldn't get the bowl. I couldn't get the spoon. And I was just crying on the kitchen floor. I'm crying on the kitchen floor. And mom says, stop crying. You're going to do it, cry for the rest of your life? <laughs> your kid was born with no arms, no legs. And I'm just thinking, like Marlene, your kids, Lukey, Preston, Elon. That Mabel, is a wise mother. Right? Your, your kids are crying for something. Isn't it just our natural disposition to say, oh, let me just help my, my baby out because they're hurting? Or they, it's just our natural response to things, right? Any, any mother would want to just, you know, grab him, pick him up, and, and that, that's a mother's instinct. But I think uh, his mother was probably just thinking, you know, God forbid I'm not here, how would he survive? So she wanted to teach him that independence. So uh, kudos to her for having the wisdom and the strength to do it because, you know, most mothers would want to, you know, and that's something that I battled with being a mom of all boys. Um, a book that really helped me uh, was a book called Wild at Heart. And it talks about how mothers emasculate their sons because, you know, we even the name, it says the father should always pick the name because if the mom picks the name, it's going to be something that's cute. And we give them that identity of like cute, but a man shouldn't be cute. A man should be because a man will get married one day and be a provider and be a father one day, you know, so that book really helped me be emotionally detached to say, okay, I have to raise future husbands one day, future leaders, future men, you know? So, but that is a mother's instinct. Wow, wow. You, you know, in a, in a, one thing about Marlene is um, Marlene is, knows how to raise boys. She's raising boys yeah. and uh, she knows how to do it. Powerful, Power. and, and now that she's doing it in a way where she, she has money, she has resources and uh, she's, uh, she's, she's raising men. But anyway, I have a question for you, Matt. I have a sure. question for you on your upbringing because people want to know because you have this seven-figure squad and mm -hmm. I have this question that I wanted to ask you for a long time, okay? Sure. You chose to put the name seven-figure squad into your YouTube channel yeah. because one of your, you you want to teach people how to become a millionaire, okay? That I believe I believe that's why it's called right. seven-figure squad. Right. And you want to do it in a way that you have a team, but you can make millions of dollars um, millions of dollars. It's not like you did it once every year, seven figures. See your income. I know your income, brother. We're on the same company. So you see your income and it keeps increasing, 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 increasing. Sure. So for you, Matt, you've been increasing your, um, your, um, I call you money blueprint, correct? Sure. Right. What, what portion is for you internal, internal, what portion is external for you? Meaning, what portion is a hey, the opportunity is great php opportunity is great yeah uh, but also what portion would it be your because many people can do php yeah. but don't reach to the levels that you have yeah. reached right or yeah. somebody might be in um in a so how much is personal internal change of your money blueprint and how much is external the opportunity for you to I, become I, a millionaire i think it, i think beginning it was 90 10. 90% internal, 10% external. And then as I've scaled, it's become more 80-20 because I need the systems and the structure and the processes and, bam, and our software called Bamboo for predictive analytics. It's more expanded to 20%. But I would say, I think even earlier on, I think we might, it might have been 95-5. All that stuff is internal bad because so much, so much external stuff, single father, uh, uh, fam family court, divorce court, you know, uh, lawyers, bankruptcy, military PTSD, upbringing, uh, broke blueprint when it comes to money. I'm speaking the financial language of broken knees, even though I want to live a millionaire life, I'm still speaking the language and thinking like a broke person. For example, Oh man, instead of going to G for Loop and getting my oil change, I just do it myself this week and it's cheaper for me to do that. That's, bro <laughs> that's broken ease language. I'll just mow my own lawn, broken ease language. Instead of saying, you know what, let me create a business and let me create jobs. Right? Let me create opportunities for the kid down the street to mow my lawn or somebody else to do my 
walk my walk my dog, those those type of things. Which many like we come from a household like it's cheaper for me to do it anyway. Like 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 what 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 Latino neighborhood says? Ah, let me just create a job. I, it's cheaper for me to do. It. I know how to turn wrenches. I know how to do. It. It's cheaper for me to do it. It's not the fact that it's cheaper for you to do. It. It's the fact that you have a higher skill set, a higher calling for your life to increase your skill set to manifest that into creating that that business. So it was like ninety five five. By the way, suggested book, Secrets of the Millionaire Mind by T. Harv Eker. T. Harv, that's a great, that's a great answer. How about you, Marlene? You grew up, your parents are immigrants from a, from Mexico. I was going to tell you, parents are immigrants from El Salvador, but you will hate me if I say something like that. <laughs> uh, from Mexico, um, tell us about you. How do you grow up? How, how do you, what happened to you mindset-wise to become a millionaire? Um, you know, growing up as a kid, um, you know, when you come here as an immigrant, you know, we, we don't come with money. My mom was a housekeeper. My dad was a cook. And growing up, um, I just think they, they, they spoke the language so much of the land of all opportunities. We're going to America. You know, we work two, three jobs. You don't see us because we're in America. So we heard that so much growing up that my siblings and I, when we were kids, we used to always dream. Oh, one day we're going to be millionaires. One day we're going to be rich one day. But it was just this imagination as a kid. I never knew how it was going to happen. I, I had no idea. And um, doing mortgages in the 2000s, uh, not a lot of people make seven figures, right? But it was still just a dream, right? One day I'm going to have, you know, the, the the toys and provide and all this stuff. But I truly think that if it wasn't for PHP and if it wasn't for Patrick but David, I don't think I would have ever gotten there. I don't know what else I could have done or gotten into that would have paid me uh, a million dollars plus a year. And I, I just think I don't know without Patrick's mentorship, because somebody said this to me this last weekend. It was a guy here in the office. And he says, you know, when I see you and your husband, you're just too far from me. He's like, you guys are millionaires. You know, you're so established. I can't relate to that. But when you talk about your struggles and how you got started, I can connect with that. It gives me hope. And it's so funny to see, to, to know that to some people, they see, you know, like this picture perfect life. I wish there was cameras on when we got started, because I remember so many times um, early in my career where I, I had so many doubts. I doubted myself. You know, I remember having breakdowns with Patrick and his wife, Jennifer. And if it wasn't for Patrick, but David's belief of like, no, you can do it right. And providing the system and the culture here in PHP and the books, right. And the associations. Um, I don't think it was all me. I think it was God's hand on me and you know just an environment that allowed me to grow and to thrive so i think there's a lot of people out there that 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 think you know can this be my life right just just get around the right environment and and eventually you'll start to see yourself that way so you didn't grow up in an environment where they believe in the opportunity but you didn't grow up in an environment where they used to tell you hey one day you're gonna become a millionaire no uh, no, the language was you're in the land of all opportunities. You should go to college. We're going to have a better life than we would have had had we stayed in Mexico. But uh, uh, no, I think it was just my siblings and I, the imagination, you know, when you grow up and you see, you know, TV, you know, I remember my mom used to clean houses and I remember as a little kid being so upset that she had to clean. I thought, why do we have to clean? Like, how come we can't live in the mansion? You know, why are we the ones cleaning? So I think um, it was that desire early on. Did you ever go that. with her? Did you ever go yes. with her? To oh, clean yeah. The house? I used to go with her, you know, when I was a kid, five, six years old, and I used to help her clean. And we had a laundry mat uh, uh, as we got older. And I remember I we couldn't leave till after midnight. We had to wait till all the people left the laundry mat. And then we had to wipe down all the machines and we had to mop the floor. And Hector, my brother and I used to clean the whole laundry mat. So we wouldn't get home till maybe one o'clock. And then we had to wake up and go to school. And we didn't mind it. But I remember thinking, why does my mom have to clean why can't she be the one that live in this mansion so i think that's when the first desire right did, uh, did you ever see the family do you ever see the family let's just say the owners of the house and you said oh, they'll see their cars so you see their lives so do you see their kids yes. say, one day i'm gonna be like that 
Oh, yes, 100%. I remember as a little kid seeing the mansions and just thinking, one day my mom won't be cleaning this big house. One day we're going to live in a house like this. And one day that will be our lifestyle. And I remember they had like, you know, exotic dogs. One of the dogs I remember they had was um, a St. Bernard. To me, it's still a fancy dog. Like, it is. Only, yeah. only rich people have a St. Bernard, right? It's still a dream yeah. of mine to have one, but you got to clean all that big dog poop, right? But dog. I remember thinking, oh, that that's like, a rich person's lifestyle, right? And uh, so seeing it as a little kid, you know, but but again, PHP house has given me the vehicle to to be able to to achieve that. But I remember so many times in my career just having breakdowns, doubting myself, right? I was sharing the story last night. There was a time in my career, I think I must have been 24, 25 years old and everything had gone wrong, everything. I mean, uh, I was in, you know, we all have high seasons and this was a low season for me. My car had just gotten repoed. I wasn't married yet. I was dating and, you know, we didn't have mentorship and I didn't read books and we were, we were broken up all the time right that was that was me at 24 years old and I remember I had put in my mind like no this is too hard I'm gonna go back and do mortgages because it's hard to start a new business so well, in PHP my mind was hard. you're ready you were already doing PHP I was yes, yes 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 I was doing PHP for like a year and I'm like I don't want to read the books I didn't want to change my identity I did it's hard to change to reinvent yourself and I remember thinking no I'm gonna go back and do mortgages a hundred thousand is enough why do I have to make a million a hundred thousand I'm comfortable and I remember I was at a point where I had had no sales my energy was bad and you know probably everything was bad and my mom put a thousand dollars in my purse with a little note that said, and I still get emotional, by the way, when I tell this story. Oh. And um, my mom put a thousand dollars in a little note that says, one day I think you'll make it. I don't agree with your decisions because I'm 24 years old. She wanted me to go to college. That's what an immigrant family thinks, right? Yep. She said, yep. um, but I think one day you'll be big, right? And it wasn't the money. It, it was just like a little inkling of like, oh, maybe somebody believes that one day I'll do it, right? So when people say, oh my God, you're a millionaire. Um, I just wish there was a little camera so they could see us. I remember when I met Rodolfo and Ceci, they spoke no English. They would come to the meetings. They would come to the training, sit in the back. And, and they, you know, people see the Lamborghini and their lifestyle today, but I remember their story. I remember the first time I met Ceci, she's like, pero que es PHP, que es lo que venden? I mean, for, you know, coming as immigrants, not speaking the language to the life that you've built, you know, we've, we've just been here a little longer, you know, but there might be somebody watching this that's doubting themselves and thinking, oh my gosh, is this for me? Just, just stick around, just stick around a little bit longer because you're so much closer than you think you are. And I'm sure you guys would agree that you always have a breakthrough, right? You know, they say it's darkest before dawn. I always feel like the most frustration that where you're at that point, it's because something incredible is about to happen, right? 100%. 100%. I, I was, uh, wanted to ask you guys a couple of questions. Uh, both, both of you, the same question. Start with you, Rodolfo. Mm -hmm. On a scale of one to 10, how hard is it to sell life insurance? 10 being the most extreme, very difficult, very technical, like you, you need a lot of skill to sell life insurance. I, I, brother, I, I think is what happened is in this sales is very difficult <laughs> if you don't know how to do it. The, but sales is the, it's so easy when you know how to do it, meaning this. Um, the problem with selling, in my opinion, especially life insurance, you know, yesterday, by the way, I sold a million dollar annuity the other day. Uh, commission is about literally one, one client. It's a lot. It's, I mean, it's a lot. It can be perspective, right? But one client can pay you $80,000, $70,000. One client, okay? One client. Meet with this client, explain to the client, you know what you're doing, you know how to explain it. One client pays 70k commission okay to the to the agent right but here's the thing um when you know what you're doing this thing is piece of cake the problem with sales is anybody's listening to this is many people treat sales like a hobby you know many people treat sales like oh my gosh i'm just gonna get into sales and i'm gonna how are you gonna make sales because i'm really good talker 
you're going to sales because I'm a very extroverted. No way, Jose. You cannot become a salesperson by doing that. It's reading, it's learning, it's human nature, it's asking questions, it's getting to know the client. Is that is selling? So for me, um, it was very difficult at the beginning because I was a unprofessional salesperson. Now, if you study, if you read the book, sales is the easiest thing in the world. My opinion, though, once you know, it's like driving. You remember when you drive it, what do you call it? Stick, 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 stick. Yeah, stick shift, yeah. Many yes. How yeah. difficult was the first time that you wanted to drive it, 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 it those oh. type of cars? Embar Very difficult. Embarrassing, especially when you pop the clutch the wrong way. Now it's what? Now you get a car like that? I, I know how to drive. Like for me, I saw the, I, you were driving the Ducati. No, to somebody asked you, do you know how to drive motorcycles? And uh -huh. you got the Ducati, the Lamborghini Ducati that Patrick has? Yeah. You were like, Man, it's like, it, for you might be easy. For me, I don't know how to drive the motorcycle, but I know how to drive the Ferraris and the Lamborghinis. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So it's- when, really, when you question know, you, how, how difficult was it for you to learn how to sell life insurance? And how, you how know, did you today? I think for Marlene was easy. No, no, to be honest, the first time um, I was introduced, I'm 23 years old, my mortgage broker said, hey, you should get your insurance license because you do real estate mortgages. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was turned off because I thought it would be a lot of math. I'm like, oh, I have to calculate a lot of stuff. I have, it's going to be too much. I thought it was going to be boring, like being an accountant, like you have to learn all these codes. And that's what I imagined. But once I realized it's like car insurance, like there's an app on your phone or on your computer. And all you're going to put is, you know, name, age, male, female, height, weight. And then you just press enter. And then I'm like, oh, so I don't have to be an accountant and figure out all this stuff. It's more like I just talk to people. Once I found that out, I'm like, oh, it's a piece of cake. So I thought it was super easy. I was more worried about the technical stuff. I'm action oriented. So there's a lot of people like me that, you know, we get bored with, with that kind of stuff. So, but I like people. So once I figured that out, I thought it was pretty easy, actually. I think, I think the same. How about you for you, Matt? Uh, yeah, it's it's a skill. Like I didn't I didn't have any business background, didn't have any financial background, didn't have any sales background. The reason why most men don't ask the girl out on a date or ask the right girl to homecoming, go to prom in high school, is because they never knew how the right approach was. They didn't know, they didn't know what the right approach. But Marlene, I'm just curious. Being a girl in high school, being asked to the dance, how would most guys? I'm just curious. I'm I, I don't know the answer to the question. How would most guys ask you? How would most guys ask you to prom? How would most guys ask you to homecoming? <laughs> you know, I'm thinking about how what it was like back in the day. I'm yeah. sure it's different now, right? Um, I'm a millennial. We didn't have TikTok or Instagram, but the way most guys would ask, we didn't have text messages, by the way, because we didn't have phones. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds kind of corny, but the way I was asked was a piece of paper. And it just said, do you want to come to the dance? Circle yes or Pathetic, <laughs> pathetic. No, How no. How did you do it, Matt? How did no you do guts. it? guts. But huh? the, I guess there was a system. Those guys had no guts, man. Okay, so who did you say yes to? Um, oh my gosh. Oh gosh, it was it was a terrible prom date. Oh, okay, so, but, but why, okay, more importantly now, who, why did you say yes to the person that, that asked you? How did they ask you and why did you say yes? You wanna know something? Uh, um, and, and I'll be honest, it was the only guy that asked. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, I'm sure maybe other guys wanted to, but it was the only guy that approached me. Wow. Hello. Yeah. Wow. That's a hint, everybody. That's a wow. hint. Wow. That, that was a that was a, that was a that's a nugget right there. Can I tell you something, Matt and Berlin? You know, on this uh, sales, there is uh, two philosophies, right? There is a philosophy of a uh, I'm going to learn everything, every single objection, everything I need to know. And there is this other philosophy is I'm just going to talk to the most people. I'm going to wing it. Yeah, but, but remember this. Way. Yes, but remember this. I am more the philosophy is I, the, while I keep improving all the skills, I'm going to talk to a lot of people. Good philosophy. You know what I mean? What, some people say, once I know everything, then I talk to one person. Oh, my gosh. You got killed in the market. I want to talk to the most people I can while I keep learning, learning, learning. And um, some people just, just want to know everything before talking to somebody. 
right? That's interesting that you said that. Yeah, you know what? I'm, I am that way too as well, because in the meantime, if I don't, I realize if I don't open my mouth and learn along the way, I'm broke. I'll, I'll never get it. I, I, I didn't have the convenience for me with the things I want to accomplish in my life to say, let me learn, 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 then go. Now, with that being said, I intensely studied for my license. I was in, I had a 2.2 GPA in high school. I was a very smart guy, but I intensely studied for my exam because I realized money was on the table. And so, so in combination with Marlene's nugget there, that the only reason why she said yes is because the guy had enough freaking guts to ask. And the reason why most people fail in sales because they just don't simply ask. They prepare, 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 and somebody else asks. Prepare, 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 somebody else asks. Oh, I'm out. Oh, it's, too, it's so hard. Or, or to Rodolfo's point, Rodolfo has this awesome uh, training that he does on sales. He says a lot of people present, 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 but they don't ask the closing question. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And when you need to ask the closing. You can be the greatest presenter, but you don't ask the closing question. I mean, you didn't, you didn't you didn't close. I mean, point? you took the girl to the to the to the club or to the dance, to the prom. You danced the entire night. You you did everything. You even asked her, let's go grab some water over there in the back. Yeah. And you didn't kiss her. What are you doing? You know what I mean? That, that, that's the point, right, Rodolfo? Let's not bring up the story about how you kissed Ceci. That's the way uh, I did it. Like Insignata. Okay, let's not bring that's that up. That's the way I did it. That's it. That's it. And says, says, says you, you, I'm kind of thirsty. You want some water? And I'm over there at the, and, the, and nobody's watching. Boom. You have five seconds. If you don't use those five seconds, that's it. Yeah. That's, that's the closing. You need to, I might not be the greatest presenter, but you become the greatest closer. <laughs> you know, somebody says, uh, this thing I'm about to always be close. You don't have, some people say, always be close. Always be closing. I agree on that. Always, I would rather, here's the thing on sales. Um, you need to, here's for me is selling. You need to put yourself in a position for somebody to tell you no. And a lot of people don't want to be in a position for somebody to tell them no. If I can risk somebody telling me no, I'm in a better position than the other person that was not willing to even ask the question for somebody to tell them no. That's for me sales. You know, one of the things we talk about in our BOMs that we do, do uh, every week, twice a week, is that we talk about if you want to make more money, if you want to create wealth, you, number one, you got to learn sales. You got to learn sales. And I'll tell you this, once I learned sales, and people think that sales is that you have to have some fancy opening or some fancy close. And then when I see Patrick sell, and then when I see you guys sell, and I see everybody else sell, and they're successful, I'm like, ain't no fancy close. Ain't no fancy, you know, opener. There's no fancy. Here's the problem. Here's some solutions. Here's some consequences if you don't partake of some of these solutions, because this problem will just continue to get worse, what do you want to do? And, and people think that sales is somebody wins and somebody loses. No, it's a win-win. Yeah. The best sales are win-win situations, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Rodolfo, what's some, of the, what's some of the myths of selling that you demystify once you started learning how to sell? Um, that you need to be pushy. Um, you don't have to be pushy. You just need to ask questions. You talk about it. You know what? Let me give you another one. Here's where people miss. Let's just say somebody says no to you today. Okay? Somebody says no to you today. But that doesn't mean that they're going to say to you no tomorrow. Yeah. So some people, they say no to me. They say, oh, my God, they told me no. So delete them. I will never talk to you anymore. So they become very sensitive with the client. Say no. They might say yes tomorrow. They might say no today, but they're going to say yes tomorrow. The other thing on sales is, um, on our myth, um, let me see, maybe that you need to be pushy. Maybe you need to um, take advantage of people. Mm -hmm. Why are you taking advantage of people? In both ways. Both, like you say, both, both parties are winning. Um, and let me give you this other one. Um, this is not a myth, but it's a story. So there is this guy who's selling shoes, right? First day of selling shoes. And um, he's very excited. He's a young guy. And he got hired by this company to be the salesman, the shoe salesman in this store. So he goes to the first store. And guess what? The first customer that comes is this wealthy guy entering into the store. Wealthy, wealthy guys. And the guy, wealthy guy enters into the store. And he says, I want, I want five pair of shoes. 
I want those, those, and those. And this is a story, very expensive. Like uh, this is Christian Louboutin type of store, okay? Red bottoms. Yeah, red bottoms, okay? You know, I'm getting into red bottoms. You know, guys, we use red bottoms too, okay? Not only the girls. So, so this is a guy, a wealthy guy entered into the store and, and buys five red bottoms in the store. Okay. Okay. And then the salesman, it's the first day of the salesman in the store. First day. So the, the customer left, right? The client, the wealthy guy left. And the owner of the store shows up. And it says, and the, and, the, and, the new, and the new employee is super happy. Look at what I did. I saw five pair of shoes today on my first sale because this wealthy guy came. And he just said, that was so bad what you just did. You're the worst. You're the worst employee I ever had in my career. And the guy is, why are you saying that? You sell five pairs of shoes. And he says, why you didn't sell it that six pair? You sell it the socks? Why you didn't sell? Oh, we, we didn't, he didn't ask for the another socks. He didn't ask for the socks. Do you sell him tennis shoes? No. Why? Because he didn't ask. But do you, do you sell the new shirts that just came? No, because he didn't ask. Do you, send the, do you sell the cologne? No, he didn't ask. Oh, so you're not a salesperson. You just order taker. Gotcha. You didn't upsell. You didn't upsell. He didn't put himself in a position for the customer said no. He should have asked him, do you want a cologne? No. Okay, good. I get it. But I ask, good. do you want the socks? No. Okay, great. He could have sell. He just took orders from the client. He's not a salesperson. Great, 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 great. Yeah, great, great story. Mer Merlin, what's some of the same question? What's some of the sales myths and misconceptions you found out that were nothing that you demystified? Well, you know, uh, um, I don't know if it's a sales myth, but one thing that I found so interesting about insurance was that uh, uh, I did mortgages. So the, there was always asking, what are the closing costs or, you know, how much am I paying up front or on the back end or, but the client pretty much has to pay through the mortgage, right? Or, or through the loan. Um, when I found out about it, it, uh, the insurance business was the client doesn't pay us anything. So the client doesn't have to cut us a check. We don't take money, you know, from the client. The insurance companies pay us to market. I thought that was the coolest thing uh, uh, about the insurance business. You know, when I first got started, I thought, wow, um, I wish more people knew that because it was so different from what I was used to in the mortgage business. So that and then the second one would probably be um, one thing that I learned was you have to talk a lot you know, talk until you're blue in the face and they finally say yes. And I realized uh, through my husband, because he's very smooth operator, that the less you talk, the more questions you ask, you make it about them, you know, you're going to be a, a much better salesperson. That's it. That's it. So I, one thing I want, I want to uh, unpack also is if, if, if you want to get ahead financially, you talk about, you know, learning sales. The second part of that too, as well, the equation, because you got to be selling the right thing. I see a bunch of guys here going to door-to-door -door sales. I see guys doing solar. I see guys doing this. I see guys, uh, you know, uh, selling cell phones, selling uh, shoes at Foot Locker and, and, and Foot Action and uh, Finish Line. All good. They're in sales. So I want to share with you, uh, I've been reading this. How many guys read uh, Forbes? Forbes. Wow. Uh, of course, right? Okay. So this one is the top 400 wealthiest people in America, right? Once a year they do this. Guess who dropped off the list? Two I have people no dropped idea. off the list. Number one is Oprah. She dropped off the list. She doesn't have enough billions to be, stay on the list. <laughs> wow. And number two, our former president, Donald Trump, for the first time in 25 years, is no longer on the list. Wow. He lost wow. money by being a president. And so this, this whole thing too, as well, the third thing we talk about in our how to create wealth, well, how to create wealth at our BOMs is, uh, uh, is sales, picking the right industry, picking the right industry and considering entrepreneurship because this whole infusion of money has got into our country. Guess where it went eventually to the hands of? It eventually went to the hands of the business people. So the common Joe got their checks, but they spent it at the businesses that people that have businesses. And guess what? New record. There's a new record here. It says new record, four, $4.5 trillion for America's richest. New record. If you add up all the billions of dollars that these entrepreneurs have made, but I want to go back to my original premise. 
is which industry that these billionaires make their billions. We always say that the fastest way to make your millions is become part of the financial service industry. You make a million dollars, be part of the right industry. But I'm wondering if it's the same thing through billions, being a billionaire. Let's check it out. Three, two, one. You guys you see my screen? The industry most likely to make you a billionaire is finance and investment. Wow. That's our industry, guys. 13% of the list is our industry. Isn't that crazy? That's crazy. Number one, that's crazy. Number two, I don't know anything about tech. There's not a college degree amongst the three of us. I don't know if we had any friends in tech. Marley, do you know anything about manufacturing and, and setting up re uh, 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 assembly lines and factories? Nope. nope. Relationship with trucking companies. And, and uh, by the way, you got to transport what you manufacture, right? That's right. In here, you don't have inventory. You know, you know what I was analyzing the other day with somebody about our industry, the insurance and financial services? There is no inventory. But you know, it was a major, major factor. Matt, you became a multimillionaire. Marlene, you became a multimillionaire. And in our industry, I became a multimillionaire in our industry. But what was the entry? What was the entry investment to become a multimillionaire in our in industry? My kid, my, in Illinois, less than 500 bucks. It, it is like ridiculous. Yeah. You know, if I, I can, be, I know I can become a millionaire doing something. Let's just say, right? Like, I'm, I, I don't, okay? I was working as here as a security guard. But let's just say somebody says, I can become a millionaire doing, you can become a multimillionaire doing real estate, buying properties, flip, flip them. But you need to have, you need to need to start with some money. Yeah, you, know so, what yeah. I mean? you need to start with some money. I can, if somebody can say, Rodolfo, I can become a millionaire. I'm a doctor and I can become a millionaire by doing clinics. Great. Have this guy over here in Houston. He owns a, uh, gas stations, multi, multi millionaire, but they do. His family left him some million dollars and went and started buying some gas stations. I didn't have my family. I mean, not, I don't. I didn't even have the two hundred bucks to get my license when I got started in the business. <laughs> so I have zero to my name, zero. So I get it. Somebody will give you those kind of money. Go and do something else. But in my opinion, um, in a, I will say, I dare to say, in America, in America, the industry with the lowest um how you call it barriers lower lowest Low, barrier, lowest barrier. Yep, yep. with the highest upside because i can just go get my license i learned and i gain one policy will pay me 70k by the way i know what i'm doing also but you have the upside is so big and the barrier to start is so low that it's insane it's ridiculous so yeah, it's definitely that's what I was saying to that one. We were analyzing the other day. It's, it's insane. I got a guy over here in my office. Man, the guy just got started in the business. Just got started in the business. Learned the business for a little bit. Just um, He's going to get paid once the policy plays $30,000. This is the first sale. First sale. <laughs> I mean, I, I wish. I wish I would have had something like that at the beginning. But $30,000 in the first sale. By the way, I got a guy in Puerto Rico. His second month in business, he made $97,000. Yeah. I mean, yep. that. Huh? That's, you know, to add to that, we've got, uh, we're just in uh, uh, Candy's office. Back in my office in Chicago and in Candy's office, we got people that have went down to Florida because they don't want to take the vaccine. They don't want to deal with these mandates. They literally left teaching. They literally left becoming a, um, a flight attendant. And they got, they, they moved to Florida. There's a bunch of them, a bunch of, bunch of those teachers, cops, and nurses left New York to come down to Florida. Wow. Um, and and one, of the, one, of our, one of our nurses in Chicago, she's having to take a part-time job in addition because her, her first job, it, I, as a, even as a nurse, is not paying enough money as a first job, and she's taking a second job as a nurse, but now she's running PHP. She's starting to eliminate that second part-time job because just part-time so far this month, she may not have made a thirty thousand dollars or or ninety thousand dollars as, as yours, but she made another four thousand dollars part time with us this month, without having to take another part time job. Bro, and uh, I'm not saying that everybody's gonna go make thirty thousand dollars in a month or, or sure. right away, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. but but at least to have an option, an opportunity, a possibility. Correct. Without having to put their health or their own faith based decision of the vaccine or not vaccine. Uh, uh, of, of mask, whatever it is. Remove yourself from all the politics. We haven't had a lot of politics in our industry. You know, we, we just came back from breaker. We just came back from the breakers 
last week. All of us were there in uh, in uh, Palm Beach, and uh, we were, we're, uh, where were we? We, to, we went to Aruba. We went, we went to uh, Maui earlier this year. The only thing we needed to take over there was a a, a COVID test to make sure we're negative. <laughs> Can, can, can I tell you something else, too, about the industry that we haven't talked about? It? And I think that, that people forget about this. So why do you think that so many people that have done insurance for five to 10 years or 15 years, they just eventually, they just retire? We don't talk about this too long. Yes. So, so often because you have in our business, you have residual income, yeah. passive income. Yeah. I mean, you can... You can work hard for five years, 10 years, and all of a sudden, but all of you guys, by the way, the, we, we, yeah, we make millions of dollars, but you guys need to talk about is there is a difference about making $200,000 a month, working, hustling, selling, buying, but you guys make that kind of money passive. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you know, Rodolfo, that's what sold me the dream the first time I met Patrick. He okay. said, hey, you do insurance for five, 10, 15 years, eventually you're going to have residual income because the policies keep renewing just like your car insurance just like your homeowner insurance and it blew me away because in mortgages if you don't eat you don't sell you don't eat you don't sell so i would see a lot of realtors that were now in their 50s and they were still selling they were still selling and i thought oh my gosh it's so hard on their personal lives most of them you know majority had already gotten a divorce or had gotten a heart attack because every 10 years the market goes up and then it goes down so there is no stability long term. So when Patrick said, "Hey, you do this long term, right?" So now to see that it's becoming a re it's become a reality, it's 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 incredible. But you're right; we don't talk about it enough. We don't yep. we don't talk about um, how amazing the industry is and how you're you're right. It's such little startup. I met a restaurant owner yesterday, and he said, uh, "We have a saying in the restaurant business: If you want to be a millionaire, start with two millions, and then you'll lose <laughs> one." because you have to invest right and then eventually you'll be you'll you'll be a millionaire right because you have lost one but you do need a big capital or even to go to school my husband did an, an interview with a, a chiropractor this guy's a doctor you know went to school he's four hundred thousand dollars in debt since covid started because who's who's seeing the chiropractor the way they used to so his business has taken a hit so you're right most careers that you think about the startup capital is so much to just get into it versus the insurance business you just got to get a license and you know something else that we haven't talked about was how awesome it is that you can use your license in other states for example in most industries you can't you're licensed in one state if you move to another state or want to do business there you have to move to that state whereas here you get a license you know in chicago as long as you get appointed in other states meaning you get a permit some states you know have different requirements but you don't have to take a test again you yeah. can use that life license nationwide and now that everything is virtual it's such a big deal because we connect through social media so you might talk to somebody that's in puerto rico they may be your, you know, your your new business partner, and you're able to conduct business in Puerto Rico, no matter where you're located in the U.S. And that's a big deal because most businesses, if I have a restaurant in California, I cannot sell in Florida, right? And, and same thing too with a real estate license. If you have, if you're in California, you have a client in Texas, right. you got to take the test in Texas. That's exactly. You know, uh, I just, uh, uh, I was introduced to a guy a couple of days ago. His name is Garrett Gunderson. He wrote the book, Killing the Sacred Cow. And uh, what would the Rockefellers be? Both New York Times bestselling books. Come to find out, the guy's a big insurance guy. He is. He is. His, his book was basically using a maximum funded life insurance contract, just the same way the Rockefellers had used to pass on generational wealth. It's interesting. If the Rockefellers use life insurance is a massive way to pass on generational wealth and create generational wealth as every uh, uh, Rockefeller's book. 153 Rockefellers are living off the family trust, which was originally capitalized by yeah. life insurance. Powerful. Okay. Powerful, right? The power of, of, of education. You know what would be really fun? If, uh, cause we're all parents, right? We have all these boys. If one day we just talk about the policies that we have for our kids, you know, this little one, he's only three weeks, so I haven't gotten his social security number yet. But as soon as we get that, we're going to set up his first life insurance, his first investment. Right. And for people watching this, you can start with just 25, 50 bucks a month. You know, as Christmas is coming, grandparents spend so much money on toys and other things. But wouldn't it be awesome to have a segment where we talk about setting up our kids 
for generational wealth. So if you're watching this and you want to see this, send us a message, right? Maybe you're a grandparent watching this or you're a parent and you're asking yourself, what can I get my kids for Christmas this year? Yep. Set up something for them because so many of the people that we study, you know, where Rodolfo says they got an inheritance, yep. there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, how amazing is it to come? You know, I had a dad that came to right. see me. He had two twin daughters and he says, I want to start a savings plan for my girls. You know, it was going to be like 200 bucks a month. I said, what's the purpose of the savings? And he says, when my daughter gets married, uh, I want to give her the down payment to the house, to their first house, to their first house. And I thought, how awesome, what a beautiful gift that is, right? So oh, but I think that would be an awesome segment to talk about, you know, and there's going to be so many parents that are going to relate. Well, if those of you watching the podcast right now, Hugo, Hiram, Milton Wright, uh, who else? Uh, uh, Naruto, Juanita, uh, Stephanie, do you think it would be a good value, great value for you, for us to talk about how to create and drain the racial wealth in the next podcast here? Uh, let's Can I tell you a story about generational wealth? Just I know we're going to be talking in the next I was driving over here in Memorial Drive. Memorial Drive is over here, or River Oaks. Over here in Houston, it's like Beverly Hills. I like, if you want to call it like that, okay? Yep. It's not like Beverly Hills. I know I'm offending Marlene that she's in LA, but anyway, okay. Uh, we'll be, I don't know, the, the, the wealthiest homes, mansions over there. So I was new over here in Houston and I'm driving and this person is driving me, I'm sorry. And I'm the passenger and I'm asking, I'm new in town and I don't know where, the area. And I'm asking who lives over here? I see these mansions, these millions and 10 millions and $20 million mansions, big homes, 10,000, 20,000 square feet homes, massive homes over here in a Memorial Drive, very expensive properties. And um, I ask him, who lives over here? He says, oh, no, Rodolfo, uh, this is only the stack of people from Houston. Hey, I want to live here. <laughs> no, he says this. And I said, uh, this is, he says these words. Until now, remember, Rodolfo, don't worry about it. This is all money. Old money, he called it. This wow. is old money. Like if I get a dollar bill, like a like a, this is old. You know what I mean? Like oh, I don't care if this is old. I want it. When well, I don't care, you give it to me. But anyway, he says old. <laughs> so you know when people refer to old money, you know what they mean is this: they were wealthy. They generation, their parents were wealthy, or their parents had a life insurance and they pass it through their kids. They grand. Imagine your all of your grandparents left you ten million dollars each. You to you something else. Yes. Yeah. But these guys got started like that. So they have somebody in their lineage yeah. that they understood money and how to transfer money to their generation to the last name. How about you guys? Did your parents um, left Zero. you anything? Uh -huh. my, my, my mother's here. My mother's here from Chicago. She's visiting. And actually, you know what a strategy is, Rodolfo? You know, like people put money inside 401ks and stuff like that. Guess, guess what I have on my parents? I have a life insurance policy on my parents as us as the owner and the beneficiary and my parents as the insured. So the money that I would otherwise save and talk the way for a 401k or an IRA, an individual retirement, I'm putting into a properly structured life insurance policy that sadly when grandma and grandpa died for my kids and my parents passed away, we then funnel that money into the life insurance trust that we establish and create our own family bank. Yep. Yeah, you know, we're so for the uh, uh, go ahead, Marley. Go the, ahead. the first time I, I heard that term that you're talking about old money versus new money, I think it was I saw Titanic. I was 11 years old. And there's the scene where, you know, the Caprio's trying to fit in, you know, with the rich people. And they're talking about old money. And they said, no, there's old money. Then there's Nuba Rouge or Nuba Reach, or what, I, either one. Right. And they said, that's new money. So I remember being 11 years old and thinking, well, I don't have any old money for sure, but I got to make some Nuba Reach, right. Or some Nuba Rouge, some new money. Right. So we're setting up the Nuba Rouge for our kids. Correct. So for generation, our kids are going to be, are going to be financially out, well, that area, right. We need yeah. to work in the other areas all the time, it's spiritual, all the educational, but financially, they are set for life. Yeah. Just because we make the decision to, I, we call it the curse. We broke the curse. Because being yeah. broke, in my opinion, is a curse. We're not yeah. supposed to live in a poverty. We're not supposed to live in a, in a scarcity. We're supposed to live in abundance. We're supposed to win. But it's so crazy how, this is, by the way, Hispanics, Marlene will agree on this. You mean with, by the way, I can take shots on the Hispanics because I'm very Hispanic, okay? Say, do you want life insurance? No, I don't believe in life insurance. Say, why? Because it's for the Sancho. I don't want to leave money to the Sancho. 
And we I'm hear like, that all the time, all the time. And, and Sa Sancho, for the English speaking audience out there, it's a new menu on Taco Bell. So it's delicious, <laughs> delicious. It's next to the gordita. You can get a gordita y Sancho. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Or the other one that you're going to hear in the, in the Latin community is, um, es de mala suerte, me vas a echar la sal. Oh, no, that's we're very thing. superstitious. Very superstitious. No, that's bad luck. If I get life insurance, it's bad luck. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, those are misconceptions on life insurance. Yeah. Misconceptions about life insurance. And there is also misconceptions on the business, too. You know, you talk about wanting to get into sales. Remember, guys, many of us, we didn't grow up or many people didn't grow up with the business environment. We, we never grew up in, a, I never grew up in a business environment where you, we, we were trained to be great employees. That's what I was trained for. I was trained to receive orders. Being entrepreneurs, you need to be creative. You need to hire people. You need to have agents. You need to, you need to have it. Somebody says to me, oh my gosh, so I'm going to do insurance. Do I have to talk to people? And I'm like, <laughs> yes yeah if you want to if you want to get married one day guess what you got to do you got to talk to people you need to talk to people want to have a happy life one day guess what you have to talk to people probably the first person you need to talk to well is yourself have <laughs> you, you need to be happy you know but uh guys i hope that you guys have found some value from this episode episode 25 uh, in the comment section not the chat box but in the comment section we would love for you to put your greatest takeaway your biggest takeaway from this conversation of course i think one of them that you guys had uh, by the way uh marlene uh, uh in, in terms of the generation wealth topic we got a m many people here that wants to hear a um uh, miguel carpio a uh, ruiz carpio says yes for that uh, uh, uh episode idea diana marquez angela alcala uh, hugo more 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 or less uh hiram figueroa they want to hear a conversation about how to create generational wealth using life insurance strategies and uh la last question for you guys here because I know PHP is much different than a lot of other financial marketing organizations, but how much money have you guys spent so far this year on marketing and advertising and buying leads? I'm just wondering how much money have you guys spent on buying leads and doing dinner seminars? Marlene, you go first. You know, a big um, it, it just sounds so old school to me, you know, back in mortgages, we used to do mailers and, and, you know, the, the bench ads and, and it, it's just, now you really don't have to thank god you know social media so uh you know for a new agent you know again startup capital you don't have to when i got started into mortgages uh the startup fee was two grand you got to pay for you know the fancy pictures and the ads and the mailers and then you had to go farming and go door knocking and it just sounds so ancient to me so <laughs> no here in hp i just i have not this year zero zero thousand buying leads nothing you, any of your agents spend money in or all of TGA any, any agents spend money on buying leads no 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 it's just it seems antiquated so no Rodolfo same question to you how much money has people in the we the people <laughs> I mean, no. spent on leads this year no I mean I, you know uh I see it like this okay we're in the technology world we're in technology world um and the other part is um I, I don't know man maybe maybe somebody else would do it. I don't know if my wife will be able to do it. Imagine Marlene going and knocking on a door and trying to meet a stranger in the 9 p.m. Marlene, maybe you, Matt, because you're military, you're <laughs> Marine guy, maybe maybe you, you, you and I, we go in a van and we jump out of the bushes and we go and talk to people. We, you and I, we could do it, but I don't know if everybody will be able to do that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And my, my, I want to be in a business where everybody has a chance to make it, okay. where everybody, if for me, what he sold me about this business was if I were to see somebody and I cannot be like them, I will be turned off because I, I couldn't do that. I could, brother, I couldn't call it. I couldn't call somebody. You know what I mean? On cold calling, people yeah. say, what did you say? I didn't understand what you say. What? what, what? Repeat. Eh, click. I have this guy who works with me. His name is, he, I'm not going to say it, but he's from Nigeria. He has a thick accent just like mine. And he used to be in an environment where leads and cold calling and everything. He come to me and say, why you left? Why are you here with me? And he says, listen, Rolfo, somebody else could do that, but not me with my accent. Yeah. Just, by the way, if his accent is thick, my accent was 
thicker. <laughs> okay. In a, a, a previous. So I'm in the business of, uh, I got like somebody else is out there listening to this. This says, you know what? I want to learn how you guys did it tonight, but I'm not, I don't have that talent yet, but I'm willing to learn. This is the company to do it. Okay. We are the company to do that because I got like me, I got like you guys. I came from nothing, immigrant from El Salvador. I have zero. I didn't even speak the language. I didn't have, it's just like, and you cannot ask me, do you have money to buy leads? Brother, I didn't have money to eat. How am I going to have money to buy a freaking lead? Yep. Okay. So for me was, I had to learn how to, how to get better. Like Jim Rohn, and I pass it to you. Jim Rohn says, says don't wish things were easier wish you were better so i needed to improve we need to improve don't make things easier because if you make it easier you're gonna get killed the market we improve that's awesome well very good hugo morales looks like he's interested in an opportunity please email uh, uh, uh paul what's the uh, email address we should send them to uh, to email phd here uh, podcast. podcast if you're interested in this conversation please email us here at podcast at phpagency.com Hugo and many other people who are watching this, the replay, if you're interested in this conversation and following through, we can connect you to a local office throughout the United States of America. Marlene happens to be in Orange County, California, in Santana, California, my old stomping grounds when I was a United States Marine. Uh, Marlene, what's, what's the address to your office there in Santa Ana? We're in 3401 West Sunflower. So we're actually three minutes away from South Coast Plaza. So, and I think it's the greatest mall I've ever seen. So, you know, we're there quite a bit. So you're, you're right, right there by Bristol. Yes. Bristol, by the way, there's a church I uh, I was attending Bible school when I was in the Marines called Calvary Church. That's where I discovered uh, Raw Reese and. Uh, um, wait, 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 Calvary. Oh, okay, I won't say. Well, yeah, actually, yeah, Calvary is right down the street from our from from our office. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, I used to stand on the outside because it was so packed in on Mondays. They had Bible study. I just would be there in the courtyard, just looking at that speakers on the outside. When I got back from the military, we got back from deployment. At, uh, so that area there was the first time I saw a mall that had valet parking. Very bougie, very bougie mall. Very nice area that you're in, Marlene. And Rodolfo, can you tell everybody what your address is in Houston? I'm in the 2901 West Sam Houston Parkway North. So guys, if, you know, if you know people in Houston, if you know people in, in Southern California, please either send a direct message to Marlene and Rodolfo uh, we shared their Instagram. Their Instagram handles are also in the description too, as well. Please how about you, Matt? In, go, go ahead, Rodolfo. No, how about you? Do your tell your area so people know where you are. Mm -hmm. And my area is in Dallas, Texas. Right now, we are in Addison, Texas, which is uh, two minutes away from our corporate home office in Addison, Texas. So uh, share share with us our uh, share with your uh, us your 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 information. We'll send you a uh, uh, directions from your location in Dallas to our office here. In Addison, Texas, we just signed an 8,900 square foot office at 3410 Midcourt in Carrollton, Texas, which is two blocks west of Midway, right here next to the Addison uh, Private Airport in Addison, Texas. So if you found value to this okay. episode, episode 25, Marlene? So that's exciting. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Exciting times. We picked out the tile, picked up the carpet, paint. It's going to be awesome right here in, in, uh, in uh, Carrollton, Texas. So. Uh, if you found value to this episode, please drop your thoughts, your comments, your questions in the comment section below. If you're watching this replay, please drop them in the comment section below. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our YouTube channel, PHP Agency, here on YouTube, and uh, also share this episode with people that you might want to say, hey, I think you want to become a first-generation cash flow millionaire. Here's three of them. And the common denominator, all three of them, not outside the fact they're in PHP Agency, the common denominator between them, they're immigrant families, and not a college degree amongst the three of them. We're kind of disrupting the marketplace and kind of disrupting a narrative in America that you have to go to college to become successful. It's one way, but not the only way. So um, on behalf of my fellow co-hosts on this episode, Marlene Gatan, thank you so much for partaking of this episode. Rodolfo Vargas, thank you so much for partaking here from Houston, Texas as well. Um, guys, a lot of exciting things to happen for those of you in the PHP uh, agency family. This is closeout week. A lot of competition. Could you imagine the prizes we're giving away for our top three, top three competitors that finish the top three in fall madness competition? Take us to the Super Bowl. Take us to the NBA Finals. Take us to the World Cup in Qatar. What? 
<laughs> that's the type of crazy things that we do here at PHP and because uh, we have a saying here is in this in, in a in the in the quote from our CEO, if you don't take care of your people, somebody else will. We have Marlene Rodolfo. I mean my I'm so I got here from Addison, Texas for the PHP studio. And until we meet again, continue to continue to help people, continue to love people, and continue to change your lives today. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week, next Wednesday, 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. Bye-bye, bye-bye, bye-bye.